So I'd like to go ahead and welcome everyone to this Center for Missional Outreach uh, Zoom call. Uh, this is uh, one of a series of calls that uh, this center and the other centers at the North Texas Conference uh, have been offering so that we can do our best to support and resource and equip and inspire um, uh, people like you who are on the ground and in the mission field, um, clergy and laity who are um, in your own way on the front lines of meeting the needs of persons um, in North Texas in the midst of this pandemic. And so uh, just at the very beginning, I want to start by saying thank you to each of you. Thank you for your ministries. Thank you for the ways that you are offering hope and light and, um, and feeding stomachs. Uh, in the midst of this time. Uh, we're grateful for you in the ways that you are uh, learning as you go and experimenting and, um, and, and pivoting in all, in all of the ways that you are. So just thank you at the beginning. Um, as you join the call, uh, most of us I'm sure are now pretty accustomed to these calls, but um, if you would uh, keep yourself on mute um, that will help the quality of our conversation. Um, at different points, you'll definitely have the opportunity to um, ask questions and make comments. Um, for that, uh, please utilize uh, the group chat function. You can uh, note your questions and comments there. And uh, I think Andrew Pfizer, who's on the call and a part of the Center for Missional Outreach, will be monitoring those closely. And uh, he and Jarita, Williams Louie, also on the CMO staff, will be um, helping to facilitate our conversation as uh, the call goes along. So as a way to uh, center ourselves, uh, I did want to offer uh, some words of scripture uh, from Psalm 146. I believe these words are appropriate uh, for us as we gather to think about the ministry of um, meeting the need of food insecurity and, and how we can uh, come alongside those who are being affected uh, most, most dramatically uh, by all of the ways that our life together as a society has changed in the last couple of months. So uh, Psalm 146 begins with an acknowledgement that we cannot put our trust in human beings. We cannot put our trust in uh, leaders and institutions, uh, but that uh, we must put our trust in God. And so picking it up in verse 5, if you'll hear these uh, words of scripture and hear them as a kind of centering prayer for us. The person whose help is the God of Jacob, the person whose hope rests on the Lord their God, is truly happy. God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. God, who is faithful forever, who gives justice to people who are oppressed, who gives bread to people who are starving, the Lord who frees prisoners, the Lord who makes the blind see, the Lord who straightens up those who are bent low, the Lord who loves the righteous, the Lord who protects immigrants, who helps orphans and widows, but who makes the way of the wicked twist and turn. The Lord will rule forever. Zion, your God will rule from one generation to the next. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, as we gather in this virtual space together, we give you thanks that whoever we are and wherever we are, your spirit abides with us. God, as we gather, we do so for your sake and for the sake of those who are suffering in, in profound ways in the midst of this pandemic. God, I acknowledge that for me, I experienced this pandemic mostly as an inconvenience, as a disruption of my norms and routines, but God, I'm hardly suffering. But we lift up to you um, those who truly are. We ask that you would draw near to them and we ask that the conversation today would, uh, would serve them, would put them at the center and would uh, help us to be in ministry alongside them in ways that will bring them uh, food, yes, support and encouragement, yes, um, and a witness to your gospel and to the truth that you are faithful 
and that you are for them. So God, bless our time together. Thank you for those who have uh, given of their day and time to not only be on the call, but to be a part of presenting and leading. God, be with them, and may you speak through them to inspire and equip all of us. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Andrew, i turn it over to you. All right, thank you for your uh, patience. <laughs> Still uh, learning this whole unmute myself business. Um, again, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, as you'll note in your chat, um, you will hopefully uh, this time find a PDF of our agenda. And on that second page, there's a list of other calls that will take place either this week or uh, later. Uh, this month and into the month to come. Uh, so I want you to be aware of, of those calls, make sure you uh, know about those. And if it's not uh, appearing to you in that chat box, just send me a chat and I will um, work on getting that uh, a little bit later in our conversation. We want to uh, welcome uh, our guests who are here with us. Um, we have a number of people who have various intersections and experiences with hunger and food uh, insecurity, especially here in this um, time of coronavirus in different ways. So uh, we have uh, Reverend Sarah Marcellus Luganbill, who's uh, the pastor uh, to family and young adult uh, ministry at Lover's Lane. Uh, Dr. Haley Feuerbacher, uh, Feuerbacher, sorry, uh, director of the Denton Wesley Foundation. Uh, and Katie Peters, who is the uh, community relations manager for Crossroads Community Ministries, uh, and Reverend uh, J.D. Allen, senior pastor at Chapel Hill UMC, and Chelsea White, who is the executive director for the Dallas Bethlehem Center. Um, am I missing anyone on the on our call here? If so, raise your hand. <laughs> A couple of folks who were not sure. Okay. Well, thank you. And I know uh, a number of you have showed up to this call because you have an interest in or experience with of late and um, for a long time about a conversation. All right, I'll work on that uh, attachment. Uh, many of you already have a uh, interest in or, or doing work in food security. So I want to thank you for that. So I'd like to um, begin with some questions just to kind of get us started um, to kind of introduce where we are uh, in our work and where that's intersecting with food insecurity. Um, so, you know, to our guests who are here with us, you know, from your vantage point, and I hope you'll kind of share a little bit about um, the work that you're doing right now. Um, who is facing hunger and insecurity at this stage of this uh, pandemic here in North Texas? What are you seeing? Whoever would like to, feels ready to begin, go to it. Um, well, I'm with the Dallas Bethlehem Center in um, South Dallas Fair Park, and we are seeing an all-out crisis um, for our neighbors. We we serve 75215 and 75210, and um, you know, it's it's clearly a, a food desert year round, and now it's just been exacerbated in our food distribution program, which we run in partnership with Crossroads Community Services. We run the program year round, and um, in the past two weeks, we've seen a 445% increase in demand, and um, it's it's only just begun. Um, it's it's trending um, up. And, and it will continue to, to do so, um, likely long after the rest of us are, you know, out of the woods of, of, um, of the issues caused by the virus and the economic ramifications for us, um, South Dallas will likely continue to suffer. And uh, 
at Chapel Hill United Methodist Church, we're part of a network called the Metro Crest Ministries Fellowship. And um, we, you know, kind of like we've been doing with church, we had our uh, April meeting, which is our monthly luncheon via Zoom and really just spent our time allowing the cities and local food pantries and other organizations to share what needs they're seeing in light of the pandemic. And it's really similar to what we've seen from what we've heard from the Dallas Bethlehem Center is um, got an email this week from the CEO of Metro Crest Services that their demand for food is up 367%. Um, meanwhile, North Texas Food Bank, the regional food bank that serves so many of our local food banks is running um, urgently low on food. And, uh, and, and but their other major resource for getting food is getting uh, unpurchased groceries from the grocery stores. And there are far fewer unpurchased groceries um, right now for the local food banks to draw from when they need additional resources. And so uh, we're seeing that need increase as more and more people, we're seeing the pantries that are really struggling with more and more people um, flowing their way because of economic distress. Um, so from my vantage point, so my daughter goes to Nathan Adams Elementary, which 89% of the students there are um, at or below the poverty line. So 100% of the children receive free breakfast and free lunch. And um, so from my vantage point, it all began with a very personal relationship. Um, this really began for, for me with Grayton's classmates. And um, the teacher reached out. She knows I'm a pastor at Lover's Lane. Uh, we have a partnership with Nathan Adams. And, um, and there was five families that couldn't, couldn't buy food. And so the teacher reached out to me. And so we started getting food. And so then I reached out to Randall Lucas, who is our missions pastor. And, um, and he was also in conversation with some of our ministry partners, some of our brothers and sisters in ministry at Christ Foundry, at Wesley Rankin, Casa Linda our own Heart of Africa fellowships. Um, and then we saw this need just begin to bubble, bubble, bubble from our own people, from the people that clean our buildings, from the people that take care of my children in the nursery. Um, it just began to explode. And so that's kind of where we are seeing um, this is in the faces of, of those that we love and care for deeply. Just to echo what everyone said, I'm with Crossroads. Um, so we have a pantry and then we also distribute food to over a hundred partners throughout um, Dallas. We're a redistributor of the North Texas Food Bank. Um, so similarly, our pantry stats are up 300%. We're seeing, you know, in February, we served 150 families. We served that in one week um, last week. So the need is insane the the faces of the people that are in need is we've never seen it before um we had someone that was let go from a major league baseball team recently that came to get food so it's it's people that we've never seen before and we know that the need is just going to continue to increase um and it's not going to stop anytime soon I'm with the Denton Wesley Foundation. So um, my campus ministry serves uni the University of North Texas, uh, North Central Texas College, which has several campuses in the area, and Texas Women's University. Um, so we are seeing um, our numbers increase by, you know, 350%. Um, our food pantry is chartered by the Tarrant Area Food Bank, and so we are considered essential. Um, so we, we get to stay open, uh, but we are the only on-campus food pantry out of the three colleges that we serve that is continuing to operate. So you have an interesting situation when you're dealing with college students because, um, <clears throat> so the college, college campuses expand so rapidly that they take up a lot of um, commercial property that otherwise could be used for grocery stores and things like that. So a lot of college campuses, if they didn't have on-campus services or really good public transportation, are food deserts. Um, and that's the situation that we have in the Denton area is that um, the University of North Texas is a food desert. 
and the public transportation routes have since changed and schedules have changed ever since the outbreak. And so our students are lacking transportation to the local grocery stores um, and they're not walkable distances. And every single campus had at least a giving shelf, if not a full blown food pantry and all of them are shuttered at this point. Um, most of the students, uh, the student employees have been furloughed. Some of them have been, um, have been officially let go from their positions. But the trouble with the furlough positions is that they're being placed on zero hours, so they're not eligible to apply for unemployment, <clears throat> but they're not receiving an income anymore. And so we've got students with no income, students with no transportation, students who are not going to be getting the, um, the stimulus check, and students who are living in a food desert. So we're trying to resource them. So one of the things that um, I'd like for y'all to speak to is I know that some have been able to note, uh, particularly here in Dallas, the effect of historic injustices and systemic racism over uh, decades, centuries, um, that has created situations around the country uh, where um, communities of color, especially, uh, and poor communities are affected, you know, more deeply. Are you seeing that? And, and could you kind of speak to that in your own perspectives? I know you, uh, Chelsea, already spoke to that a little bit. Um, yes, just to kind of continue on that, um, you know, I've been saying that if I didn't already fully understand um, what systemic racism looks like, I would now, um, and I think it will be undeniable. From the virus standpoint alone, what we will very likely see, whether we actually get these numbers or not, which is a whole other, whole other call, um, is more people in South Dallas Fair Park will get the virus. Of those who get it, more will die. Of those who um, recover, more will have long-term health consequences. And that's just the, the immediate health issues with the virus. So with food, for example, you know, I live in Arlington and I have four different grocery stores within walking distance to where I live. When I go to the grocery store, shelves are, clean, are cleared off and I've got four around me. I have the means and I have a vehicle to go to other stores to or on Amazon, um, and and it's still slim pickings for me. When you live in South Dallas in a food desert, um, public transportation is really unsafe. They're they're taking it anyway. Um, they're panicking because there's one grocery store. It's expensive. It's cleared out. Um, it, it's everything is just all of the regular crisis of South Dallas is just going to get worse and it all stems from these very historical systemic issues even with um, the the students so DISD initially was offering um, hot meals at um, two schools in the South Dallas area and they actually had low turnout the reason is because the kids don't have transportation to get there. Those kids take school buses to get to school and school buses aren't running. And so now they're trying to identify other locations, including DBC to, to serve hot meals. So, I mean, you really can, can go on and on just playing connect the dots of the many different ways um, systemic racism plays at a time like this to, to make things so much worse for South Dallas. Thanks, Chelsea. Others, where are you seeing kind of these historic uh, lines of injustice and systemic racism kind of in raising themselves? I'll, I'll kind of share um, what Christ United Methodist in um, Plano. Uh, we do a we serve food on Wednesdays at uh, something called 
um, sandwich blessings. And we've done that for um, almost two years. And um, this is, um, we also partner with street side showers, which many of y'all may know what that is. And so they're able to come get showers, get fed and that kind of thing. And what we've seen is just um, all the, our folks that are homeless, their resources are just absolutely gone. Um, you know, including bathrooms, you know, not being able to get in bathrooms to um, clean up, you know, and to go to the restroom and that kind of thing. And so um, our homeless coalition luckily um, intervened and we actually have one park that they have opened up the bathrooms. But, um, you know, just the concern of not having food, but also um, just the dignity of these folks that are living on the streets. And that's kind of with this um, pandemic is um, taking away those resources. It just strips them of their dignity as well. It's what, you know, really, really um, disheartening. I think one of the struggles we find in our neighborhood with the uh, uh, very rapidly growing Latinx population is um, we have a number of folks because they're undocumented are going to have far less access to the kind of benefits that are being offered, um, whether that's SNAP or unemployment or stimulus checks or any of that. And so um, if they lose employment, uh, if they're in not job, uh, jobs that are considered non-essential, they 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 feel the hurt even more because they have a lot less, they have a lot fewer places to turn in our community to uh, get the assistance that they'll need. And we've been trying, we've uh, just been, we've been staying in touch with the school that we're partnered with to try and help keep communication with the principal and community liaison to try and coordinate, you know, as to what families may have the greatest needs in the school we've had a partnership there for a few years now um you know and as is you know as many of us have in the conference in recent years and uh, that's helped us uh, kind of start to identify where those needs are and how we can help fill those gaps so Yeah, so working on the college campuses, I mean college campuses are sort of a, a solid bowl of intersectionality, right? Um and it really becomes a um, salient intersectional class issue as well. Um, so definitely the majority of the students that we're serving are international students or people of color. Um, we have a large number of single mothers. Um, I myself was a parenting single mom as an undergrad, a grad student and a doctorate student. Um, and I'm seeing that reflected in our, um, our clients and students that we serve. Um, but the, the funny thing about college education, especially in the context that I'm in serving NCTC, UNT, TWU, is that college today is not like for the privileged anymore, right? Um, and these are three of the most affordable colleges that you can attend in our area. And um, so what we see happening is um, because, because there's this narrative and the actuality of like needing a college degree in order to get jobs, and this is the narrative of how you better yourself or whatever, um, and we're making student loans so available and so predatory, um, lots of our students are seen going to college as the most economic option because you get a student loan, right? Um, and the student loan is um, going to help them get better jobs in the future, but it also will provide them with better housing than what they could probably afford without that college degree. And so um, a lot of us end up selling our souls to go and get an education. And so here they are, they are in these college campuses and the rug is just completely pulled out from underneath them. Um, a lot of them because um, they're first generation students or because of just the class issues in our country, they're coming from families where they're not being funded by their parents. Uh, about 75% of my own students in my community are um, self-supporting and yet there's, their parents still claim them on income taxes. Um, and so because of that, 
um, the parents need to claim them on in income taxes because the parents are struggling as well economically. Um, so these students um, can be claimed on income taxes up to the age of 25. And that is leaving them without the means of getting their own health care, um, without the means of being able to make their own decisions on a lot of things. A lot of them are impacted by their parents' credit scores, and they're not going to be getting stimulus checks because they're being claimed by their parents. Um, at the same time, so one of the things that's been largely frustrating to me in um, Pandemicville is that um, this is a really ignored population because we're still operating under this idea that college students are privileged and comes, come from families of some privilege who can afford to send their kids to college. That is simply not the case. And so nobody's really looking out for this population. And um, they're not considered productive citizens. And so there's not a whole lot of intervention that's trying to uh, make sure that they're doing all right right now. Um, also, we serve students who are um, have different disabilities. We have um, deaf students in our community who access our food pantry. Um, we are open and affirming of um, the LGBTQ community. And so we are a safe space for the trans community. And um, one of the things that I've been hearing throughout all of this is that has been an obstacle prior to the pandemic to getting a job. And that's becoming even more of a barrier now to finding any sort of employment. Um, if you can't hear, you can't do Zoom calls. If you're deaf, you can't do Zoom calls unless you have an interpreter on it. Um, if you are trans, there are no protections in Denton to, you know, in, in the job place. There just aren't. Um, if you didn't, don't have transportation, you can't drive for Uber Eats. So these are things that are intersectional and historic and class-based and race-based and have to do with our gender, look at single moms, sexuality, all of these things taking place on a college campus and it's being ignored because of this narrative that's been operating for the past 50 years that's no longer relevant about privilege in college. Thanks, Haley. Um, anybody else want to jump in on, on, this, on this vein from our panel? If not, you know, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, some of these concerns that you've already raised um you know may fit this category but really what what are the the top concerns for you and your organization or church right now um as you think about how to move forward in this situation with alleviating this kind of food insecurity uh, as you see it is it money is it volunteers is it all of the above. Um. I can start. Um, at Crossroads, our biggest concern right now is food supply. Um, as someone else mentioned on this call, the North Texas Food Bank is um, extremely low on food, and in turn, all of our partners are low on food in our pantry. So, um, you know, we're trying to get as much food from outside vendors as possible, but just like the grocery stores are out of food that's directly related to food banks being out of food. So um, that's a big struggle right now. Um, kind of your basic items like rice, pasta, canned items, there's just none of it available. So we're hoping that that'll ramp up soon. Um, and then we're thankful to have enough uh, volunteers and staff. We've been working with Shift Smart to have employees on site that are helping with our pantry. Um, but I'd say, you know, we're all still concerned about someone getting coronavirus and not being able to do the good work that we are doing. Um, so that's a concern. We're obviously trying to keep all everybody safe and take all the precautionary measures, but just don't know if that's going to be enough. So we'll see. Thanks, Katie. Others? Um, 
Andrew, I know on a local church level at Chapel Hill, I mean, we are a, we are a older church right now. And so we have a concern about our folks getting out. So we're trying to do things in a way that discourages them from doing extra shopping. For one, the younger members of the church are volunteering to do their shopping for those who will uh, allow us to. And, but also when we're providing these relief efforts, we're focusing more on monetary donations that um, either where we can either get a list of much needed food supplies from the food banks and we'll have a designated shopper that takes the money donated to pick up those supplies to take to the food bank or simply send the check to the food bank so they can get things. But uh, some, I, I don't know, uh, Katie and, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm dropping a name here, Dallas Bethlehem Center, they may have more insight on how they, how they feel like local churches can best facilitate that. But I know our main, our, our concern too is our older members staying healthy. So we're trying to help, help give them ways to help without further exposure to the virus. And JD, can, before we let you go, um, can you also speak from um, your connection with Texas Impact and this kind of higher level advocacy piece um, and kind of what's going on politically around the state and country? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I wasn't sure if that was for now or later, but uh, there's, a, there's a couple of parts that we can be working on there. Um, uh, local churches, we have pastors, members, and everything, and I can post links on how to connect with this information and how to sign up for their advocacy work, too, is um, the main food security or food insecurity emphasis right now that Texas Impact is communicating to its members, and this comes out of uh, the... Uh, the Washington Interreligious Staff Community, and um, well, I'm trying, I can't remember the other organization's name off the top of my head, but um, the biggest needs they have uh, in terms of advocacy on the federal level is, you know, seeking in the, in the upcoming stimulus bill to increase SNAP benefits by 15%. So uh, unemployed families, working poor families will have more on hand to actually go and acquire groceries. Um, they're seeking to increase the minimum monthly benefit from $16 to $30 and um, can suspend all administrative and looking to suspend all the administrative SNAP rule changes indefinitely because of this uh, time of economic distress and long-term recovery. Um, I've got a, I've got a website from Texas Impact here that I'll share in the chat. Um, here in a minute um, so that everyone can go there and then you scroll down the page and it shows kind of the different uh, pandemic related emphases but those are the those are the matters strictly for related to food insecurity although the others you would I would also look at the uh, the utility um, assistance and advocacy needed there too because whether that's on a state level a federal level or a local level and if uh, people can't keep their water on or keep their electricity on they can't cook food. And so uh, those are, are pretty important matters to keep in mind as well. And then the other advocacy piece that I just, I start, I started on in the last couple of days, just trying to put out feelers and figure out if there's anything to be done here. And it sounds like maybe there is, um, is I reached out to the Texas Department of Agriculture um, after hearing all these stories of uh, farms who were disposing of produce and dairy and and dairies that were dumping milk because their distribution channels, say restaurants and other uh, pl other such places, were you know they didn't have those to sell to anymore. So I reached out to that department to see if any work is being done to facilitate the delivery of those kinds of goods, um, even at a low cost or something, to our regional and local food pantries to try and meet some of the um, need that we're facing in our food pantries right now because doesn't make any sense to be throwing food out. Um, I, I mean, and um, I talked to uh, Jordan Gregory, who's the policy um, specialist in that department. They said there is conversation ongoing about what they can do to link uh, those farms with food pantries during this time of crisis. So, um, and I can also, I'll also send, I'll also post a link on the chat with uh, contact information for the Texas Department of Agriculture. Um, I think the more we can send emails, at least maybe not phone calls, because I'm sure they have plenty of phone calls coming in already. The more we can say, hey, we're, this is where we're seeing the need and this is where um, we would love to see action on, um, then uh, we can certainly 
help maybe help facilitate the movement on that. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's resistance. They said there's actual work to get that done. But I would also encourage you to not, when you reach out to your uh, state representatives and state senators about uh, SNAP benefit, well, those are federal matters. We, you can call your state senators and state representatives to encourage them to encourage our Texas Department of Agriculture in their work and to seek ways to make that possible. Um, they're not in session right now, but they can still have a voice, um, whether it be with the governor, or lieutenant governor, or the departments. Um, and then, of course, you know, with the Texas Impact stuff, Texas Impact usually works on the state level. They're an interfaith group that's based on its uh, member organization's social principles and what they have in common. Um, but right now, they're working on the they are working on the national level because uh, the, of the, the main food insecurity in terms of uh, advocacy that can be done right now is on the federal level since our uh, state legislature is not in session. So I'll, I'll share those links and those are just a couple of things that we can be uh, um, thinking through and and kind of give some voice to uh, going forward. Thank you, JD. And, uh, and for those of you who need this information, JD, I believe you're still on the board uh, for Texas Impact, is that right? And uh, kind of our conference liaison? Yes, I'm one of our okay. uh, conference board members. And okay. so I, I get regular communication uh, from Texas Impact. And um, they also have, I should have mentioned this before too, they also have the rapid response team, which anybody can sign up for, where when there's a legislative matter where advocacy is needed, you'll, they'll send out an email and text to people so you can contact your elected officials to uh, advocate for, uh, for those in need in terms of policy. So. Thanks, JD. Chelsea, uh, before JD, um, before we turn to JD, uh, you looked like you were about to say something. Oh, yeah. So for Dallas Bethlehem Center, our needs um, primarily are for donations. We need funds. Um, it's, it's clear that there's um, beyond groceries, there's a need for hot meals, um, just like what DISD is trying to offer to the students. Um, oftentimes, you know, when students go to school, that could be their only meal they, they receive for the day. And now that they're not in school, um, we want to plug in, we have a commercial kitchen, we have a um, kitchen manager who's actually a caterer, uh, born and raised and still living in, in South Dallas. And so that's a way that we can plug in and meet a huge need. Um, but that that will cost money. And our, our ability to, to turn on that program or not is, is based solely on our ability to get funding for it. So um, that's, that's my biggest concern is, you know, the, the amount of expanded programming we can do is, is simply based on um, how much funds we receive. So that's, that's our biggest ask. I'm up in uh, Crum, which is northwest of Denton. Uh, so we are in a more rural area. The food pantry in town doesn't just serve the town, but it serves the whole ISD. And with the other stories, there is greater demand uh, due to loss of employment, loss of income. And uh, our church has been having uh, or holding food drives every other Sunday in order to get an effort to collect as much as we can to funnel to the food pantry. And we put out the list of most needed items, plus we also uh, collect money to give to the food pantry. So that has been going great. We've had a very generous response before uh, the pandemic. We already at the church encourage people to take the list of most needed items to the food pantry. And as they were doing their weekly shopping for themselves, they also picked up for the food pantry and bring it to the church on Sundays. And so that helped us going into this. But what is um, my concern going forward, the church has been very generous. We are a small older congregation and they've been very generous but there's going to have to be perseverance and encouragement for this to be a sustainable effort. I think the, um, the donations will drop off as there's going to be a greater need. And so for us, it's going to be perseverance when, um, and I'd like though to be able to widen it more to, than just our church people uh, on these drives. When I was listening to JD talk about um, 
uh, the, the farming situation, I was thinking back years ago to when we used to uh, help with the Gleaning Network of Texas, where we would go out into the fields and um, pick the produce that would go to the food pantry. And I know that was uh, Susie Marshall years ago. I don't know if we still have a Gleaning Network today or something uh, similar that we could join in on. Yeah, and Sonia, I've reached out to um, uh, Susie Marshall, who's now with uh, Grow North Texas, uh, to see what connections we might be able to make in that uh, venue. And as uh, Deborah Hobbs Mason has noted in our chat box, we have a lot of idle uh, buses and vans, and you know, possibly there's a way for us to put those to work. Um, so if anybody else has any connections in that. Um, kind of gleaning network, uh, you know, speak up or let us know. Uh, others, Haley, what's, I mean, what's the concern for y'all moving forward? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there are two ways of like addressing the situation, right? Um, there's crisis response um, where we're dealing with the lack of access to food that's happening right now. Um, because of the pandemic. And then there's systemic justice work because there's still gonna be a lack of access to food um, from probably the majority of the people that we're currently serving. There's still going to be lacking access to food when the pandemic ends. Um, right now, the crisis response needs that we have are like what y'all were mentioning, in-kind donations go a really long way. Um, Financial donations are super helpful too. Um, they don't go as far, but they're needed and valuable. Um, right now, to be COVID conscious, we are doing um, curbside pickup and delivery. So most of our students, like I said, um, don't have transportation. And so most of our uh, the students that we serve, or I'd say about like half the students that we're serving right now, um, are needing grocery delivery. And I have, um, I can have about five volunteers work every week with our food pantry. These have all been student volunteers. And I have one or two students who have cars of their own. So it's been me and one or two students driving to about 75 different households um, the past couple of weeks. So if anybody wants to volunteer to help drive, um, we do it every Friday. So that would be a huge help. For um, the future, one of the things that has been um, limiting in the past for us is that people will earmark funds to our food pantry. Well, this is great. We get to spend that money on food purchases. But again, we're treating a crisis situation, we're treating a systemic justice situation as a crisis situation. And that is not um, sustainable and it's not empowering and helpful. It's not promoting change. Um, my organization, the students that I have are extremely like politically mobilized and astute and aware, and they've got really great ideas on how to advocate for justice. And so we would like to see a little bit more trust in our organization when it comes to financial giving to where people don't earmark their funds and they give to our ministry in general and trust that we're going to use it to try to get at the root of these injustices. Um, so that would be a big need of ours going forward. And then um, I was really glad that JD talked about advocacy. Um, there are some things that need to be advocated for simultaneously as we're working on um, the crisis situation that we're facing right now with food insecurity. Things like um, trans rights laws and protective laws for trans, the trans community in Denton. There are ordinances in um, some of the surrounding areas, including Dallas, but there's not one in Denton right now. Um, Amber Briggle, I can post her contact information, but she is spearheading the work on that. Um, we, there are sprinkled around the country, there are, um, there's advocacy for student workers who are treated as disposable and uh, who are not supported and there needs to be a larger national movement. Um, so in the 
the future, I'd like to see us like gaining some momentum in that direction to protect our student workers. Um, and also to do some work on more accessible and affordable education. Um, additionally, I could talk all day long about um, single mom's rights. I'm not gonna take that space today, but that is something that I would love to see a conversation generated um, in the North Texas conversation around. Thank you, Haley. Others? Okay. I will tell you, Grace Avenue has been having ongoing food drives for our both our um, food pantries, Frisco Family Services, which Carrie Keck's on this uh, call today, and our Little Elm Food Bank. So we've had an ongoing seven days a week, 10 to four, and we've had a great response. We um, just did our, a mission video for them and, and as far as including them. So that has been really successful. I'm hearing up it, it is what's next? What is the next? We're seeing middle class coming into the food banks. We're seeing more people um, addressing and saying um, rent assistance, um, coming to the churches and saying, you know, pay my, pay my rent um, or what can we do? So we're trying to grasp that and put our hands around that. But it's the same question as we're having um, with um, everyone else's as far as what uh, food insecurity. And uh, I don't mean to call you out, Michelle, but I, saw, I just saw your um, inclusion in the chat box. Would you mind sharing about your context and what you're seeing in your rural context? Um, we're just a much smaller town. We're in Jacksboro. So uh, we've only got one grocery store and one dollar store. And when things are gone, they're gone. So a lot of the kids in our, our neighborhoods are lacking meals. So the school being small enough, reached out to each family to see what the need was and have faced um, food routes with the bus drivers and the um, school buses to deliver meals. So each day they get a lunch for that day, plus a breakfast for the following day to hold them over until lunch the next day. So that's what they're doing. And then we have a food pantry here that I'm involved with that um, we only serve once a month and we give them about a week's worth of food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then we have the produce truck that comes to town because of the food desert um, twice a month that anybody can get from. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, Dorita, could you help us um, think about how we can take action with your questions? Or um, thank you everyone for sharing um, your insights and your expertise and for doing the work that um, is necessary for us to love our neighbors, um, not just in crisis or in pandemic, but um, on a regular basis. So thank you for um, already having the infrastructure to, to do that service. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, how um, can we get on board and come alongside and help to resource and um, give our uh, constituents uh, ways to help um, uh, what your efforts are doing in the pandemic? What are some other uh, ways that anyone can think of that are innovative or that um, you're already doing that we can pad or that we can continue to contribute as um, a conference and at the conference level? Um, what are some ways that we can do that? You know, I was talking to Andrew last week about this and I said, so one of the things is, as I've been thinking about like, my concerns and my fears as we're moving forward is so I really think that this has revealed some of our greatest shortcomings as a church. So we're the United Methodist Church and we are supposed to um, be connectional. That's one of the greatest things that we have going for us and that we haven't been doing it well. And I think we all know that. Um, but this has definitely revealed that. Um, and a few years ago, we had our one plus one. And, and it was through that that we built relationships with Nathan Adams Elementary. And we have a relationship with WT White, which is a high school and DISD. And so through those relationships is how this began. And so I began to talk to Andrew about what happens if all of us who have a relationship can go to principals and go to teachers and say, what, what needs do you see that we can help respond to? And then what happens if we have, as churches just simply begin to connect those um, and to begin, I mean, things like this are so, so, so helpful, but even in a, in a, in a 
really grassroots relationships form what, what happens with that um, and just how we could take these few fish and loaves and what we could do with them um, by just offering those up um, to, to Christ. And so that's been kind of my, my really the biggest thing that's just been on my heart. And I think that the spirit is really challenging. Um, and thankfully, I think the same thing is happening. It's interesting to see what happens even in our own church. Um, Randall Lucas is making such relationships with um, some of our, uh, you know, some of our sister churches that um, he's simply calling and saying, how can we help? Um, and just watching that grow has been incredible. So how can we do that better? Thank you, Sarah. So anyone else, how can we be um, present with our neighbors when we are um, separated? <laughs> How can we um, help those who don't who don't have the infrastructure to have uh, or the the capability to have Zoom calls and um, those um, I'm sure college students and um, a lot of our students in our ISDs, especially in rural areas, um, they don't have um, Wi-Fi readily available for them to um, continue the schoolwork that needs to be done. Um, how can we encourage um, teachers? You, you spoke of one plus one. That's my uh, one of our um, initiatives that we're attempting to feel our way through and how we could revitalize and how we can um, continue to shore up those relationships and help our churches to go deeper in those relationships. And so um, are, are there any other ideas we want to highlight or lift up for um, how we can come alongside as churches um, in those areas? One of the things that would be um, helpful, I think, to a lot of, probably a lot of us, I think, um, I, I know I'm not the only person who has, you know, deaf students in my ministry or deaf people in my congregation, um, but there aren't a lot of resources out there um, in terms of access to interpreters uh, for a reasonable cost. Uh, and we're, you know, we're just a small student ministry. Our students don't, you know, we, we don't take up a weekly offering. We've got students. Um, so we rely on the generosity of donors, um, which is, yes, and, um, and also a grant from the North Texas Conference. Um, so we have a very, like, a shoestring budget. And interpreters for us cost anywhere from $180 to $210 per um, worship service. So we're paying that out at least once a week. Um, on Zoom calls, we are hiring interpreters at this point to come into the call and sign for us. Um, we don't have the ability right now financially to make those um, interpreters available at things like our food pantry. Um, I also found out that the organization that we've been, I mean, there, there's basically like one organization that, um, people um, that I'm familiar with that people um, hire interpreters out of. And I just found out last week that the interpreters make about a third of what we're paying out. So if I'm paying 200, um, they're making, I mean, at most, like anywhere from, I think what I was told was anywhere from like 30 to $50 of like that 180 to, so I guess it's more like a six, um, 180 to $210. Um, so if we could come up with ways of providing access to interpreters in a more ethical manner, um, that would be awesome. Thank you, Haley. Um, I think um, Catherine has a resource that she's lifting up in the chat box. So maybe that's something that um, as a connection, we can um, uh, help to um, find interpreters. And I, I appreciate that ethical piece 
that um, that we're speaking to as well. Um, in in times of crisis, sometimes we want to cut corners and cut people, but this isn't um, something that we want to um, uh, continue or do or be mindful of. So thank you for raising that up. And 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 really acknowledge ableism in this. <laughs> uh huh. And so are there any other, Andrew, are we? I was gonna share um, just something. We have a tutoring program at Christ United and um, throughout the year, the school year. And we have um, our, our, it's one-on-one. -on -one. And so what we've been doing is actual Zoom or FaceTime tutoring during this time. And we did have some people through, um, the corona issue went and stayed with relatives and so we have done things like pay for internet service and stuff like that so kids could um, keep up with their schooling um, so but, but I will say I'm so grateful that we had those relationships built prior or that wouldn't have been possible you know to to do that I'm, I wasn't showing who that was speaking. Who was that? Was that Jenna? I'm, I'm Jana. The Jana Grimaud. Jana. Okay, I, I, yeah. I couldn't see um, who was speaking, but thank you, Jana. That's really um, um, helpful. Um, just a reminder of um, school, I think uh, school partnership and church school partnerships are low hanging fruit for us to build relationship um, outside of what we would call crisis the pandemic this is only a crisis for most of us who are privileged um but just having um, that opportunity to um, connect with um, teachers principals and um, parents is um, ideal for allowing relationship and we do have resources to help you do um, more more good than harm um, and so um, if, if you're interested in, 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 in um, helping or, or allowing us to help um, you come alongside those um, church schools um, partnerships, that would be something that we're um, completely interested in helping you do. Hey, Jarita, it's Montreal. How are you? Hi, Montreal. Well, how are you? I'm well. Uh, I joined in a little late, so um i just wanted to know is there um and this may be a suggestion as well um a possibility for a opportunity to have a resource page since we are connection like someone just lifted up and uh it sounds like we just don't know who has who has what 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 ministry what church has that um has that resource available uh, that they can possibly partner with another ministry that is in need um, and that, you know, that possibility they can resource together. I don't know. Um, but uh, it sounds like we just need a resource page either on the conference website or something that we all can go to and say, hey, that's what Lover Lane is doing best. Can we possibly partner with them instead of just recreating or looking elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Thanks for lifting that up, Montreal. Yes, we absolutely do have a resource page already for um, the CMO. And we're also, um, th that was my next question um, for us to highlight those of you who are already doing the work and what you're doing. If you would send a link to the chat um, box, um, Andrew will be um, putting together a resource page so that we can do just that. Um, because uh, like we said, so many times we are siloed. We're not quite sure who's doing what and how they're doing it. Um, I think these Zoom calls, uh, COVID has done a good job of helping us to get together around the conference to know what everybody's doing. Amen. So I'm hoping that we could uh, get these resources um, put together and placed on our, our website so that um, we can connect and we can do, um, uh, Andrew, Andy and I can help with the connection part um, uh, since we are at the conference to help you um, uh, not have to do so much of the lead work and we can do the connection part for you. But yes, we are, are work we'll be working on that um, resource page uh, for you guys to have access to from our website. Awesome. Rita, thank you. I, I mean, it's a, uh, elaborate on one piece you said there, um, and that is that uh, Montreal uh, absolutely, I mean, yeah, a printed piece um, 
there's one in process already on the website. It's constantly being revised. But I would the thing I want to say is that relationships have been noted um, several times on this call as the real key uh, to doing this kind of work in ministry. And so at any point, if any of you are aware of a particular need, Montreal, like you said, uh, feel free to share that uh, with myself or with Charita or with Andrew. And uh, just by virtue of the role we play, we, we have a lot of relationships across the conference and we may be aware um, without, without a pre-printed list of people who um, could be a partner or helpful um, resource to you. So, uh, I mean, feel free to uh, reach out to us and uh, together the relationships we share, the connection we share can, can do a lot of good. So that may be the shortcut, call one of us. <laughs> awesome, thanks. One quick note, uh, if you don't mind me asking, uh, Dorita, um, Katie with Crossroads, uh, have you already mentioned, uh, forgive my uh, memory, about kind of the status on taking new applications? Yeah, so we're, our pantry is open Monday through Thursday, 9 to 3. I just sent it in the, in the chat. Um, we're serving anybody that can come to our location. Um, our partners that we're currently serving, I think I mentioned we, we have over 100 partners that we provide food to, and then they provide it to their community, Dallas Bethlehem Center being one of them. Um, we actually had to put a hold on any new partnerships. Um, because we just don't have the food right now. Um, and we want to make sure that our current partners are able to feed their community well because they have already been established and have the volunteer base and have the capacity to be able to do so. Um, so unfortunately at this time, we're not bringing on board any new distribution partners. Um, but if you guys are interested in it becoming a partner in the near future, we're hoping this dies down soon, um, reach out to me and I can get you steps on how to get started. I had just one follow-up question, uh, if it's all right, Dorita. Um, who of the organizations that are represented here, um, who all is participating in North Texas Giving Day now, which is coming up on March, or, or, sorry, um, May 5th, I believe it is. Hands up, so you got um, the Westland Denton, Dallas Bethlehem Center. Will Crossroads be a part of that? Do you know? Okay. Um, Christ Foundry, United Methodist Mission will be participating in that. So those are ways that um, uh, you can do some good fundraising uh, and possibly can um, have funds matched by organizations that might sponsor them. Uh, so that's a great way to, to give coming up. Able to offer um, kind of a closing benediction for us. Absolutely. Um, just want to thank everybody again for uh, jumping on this call. There are so many things that um, I know each of us have um, to do and that we're going um, through ourselves and, and how we're attempting to walk alongside our neighbors in this time. And so this, uh, I just had a, a prayer from Pixie Lighthorse um, that I wanted us to think about and it's um, entitled Honoring Loss of Control. I don't know about you, and most days, um, you know, we, we like to have the um, illusion that we have a little bit of control of things, and I'm sure COVID has helped us know and um, be reminded that we do not. And so um, you would um, just bow your hearts. You don't have to close your eyes or bow your heads or anything like that, but just contemplate and hopefully take in these words by uh, Pixie Light, Light Horse. God, thank you for this exhausting day of pure chaos. May I seek to loosen the stranglehold on what I cannot ultimately keep together so that deeper understanding of what is at work can flow in. May I dedicate myself to becoming more at ease with all that is flowering in directions I cannot stop. Help me to see where I can be useful and focus my energies there. 
reinforce my awareness that I, I can do my part for evolvement rather than striving unceasingly for perfection. God help me see control as the illusion of containing what is not mine to hold. Let me fall apart when I need to and make room for others to splinter into smithereens too. Let there be a return to wholeness that offer, offers more than can be found in a tight, anxious cluster. Let me make space for more possibilities to unfold, not for just the one I hope for. Help me to see where I habitually strive for control, but don't actually want to be in charge. Let the sword I carry be swung only at false perceptions. God, open me to the real experience of life, free from the need to sweep up around it obsessively. Help me take care of the cluttered rooms in my mind, flushing out the buildup of reflexive patterns that no longer serve me or serve others. Help me cope with unpredictable circumstances and environments, knowing that I will find the tools to buffer my hyper responsiveness. Help me learn to let it go. Guide my nerves to sanctuary when I quicken to overreact. Inspire me to delight in emancipation from the confinement of my ideologies of supreme exactness. Unshackle me from rigid expectations and smooth my brow with the hush of my appreciation of you. Amen. <laughs>